afternoon, everyone. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brenna Grant, manager of Canfax Research Services, and I am here to talk to you about the Canadian Cow-Calf Cost of Production Network that we launched this spring. And we have a lot to talk about this afternoon, so we're just going to dive right in. We have some, frankly, some troubling stats to start off with. According to the 2018 US Small Business Trends Report, only 56% of businesses make it past their fifth year, with 82% of businesses failing due to cash flow problems. And only 40% of small businesses are profitable, with 30% breaking even, and 30% are continually losing money. Now, these are for all small and medium businesses, not just agriculture. But these figures relate to those businesses that started in 2014. And I don't think you need me to tell you that COVID is making things more difficult for small businesses. And this really means that management is key to success. Now, when you think about benchmarks, there are generally three types that we talk about, and there is a role for each of these. You sort of start with comparison of self to self in order to see progress over time. Second, we have a comparison to maybe a provincial average that really tells you how you stand in terms of the competitive environment that you're operating within. But it's really the middle piece about comparison to others with similar production systems in order to see possibilities that we're really interested in with the cost of production network. So when you see the results today, you may think some of this may be kind of messy, but I want you to be thinking about what it means in terms of possibilities for technology transfer, incremental improvements for competitiveness from a producer perspective. So this spring, we went out and had 115 producers participate in focus groups um, from coast to coast, and we developed 28 benchmark farms. Three of those were dairy beef operations in the Maritimes, but we had 25 different production systems for cow-calf operations in different provinces across the country. And what we found is probably what you would expect which is an upward sloping supply curve with a wide range in both cash costs and total costs per cow. Now, you've got to remember that some of these differences are due to the stage of the operation, with some of them being startup operations and others being mature. And so it's not just the production system choices that are reflected here. But again, it's all about possibilities. And what is it possible for a cow-calf operation to achieve? We're not looking only for the average, but that range and diversity. Now, it can be really easy to get lost in all of the data. So we broke it out by primary winter feedstuff. Now, we've got to remember that all of these can be delivered in a variety of ways. And one of the things we learned in discussions with producers is you should make no assumption about delivery method based on what kind of a feedstuff they're using. It's just as easy to deliver a TMR on pasture or in a field in order to spread that manure as it is to feed it in a corral. So these are the exact same results, but divided out by winter feedstuff. The point is you can be low cost with any winter feedstuff. You can also be high cost with any winter feedstuff. So there's lots of other factors coming into the competitiveness question. Here we have all of our cow-calf operations. And on average, there was a total cost of just over $1,100 per cow with around $700 of that being cash costs, $130 being your depreciation cost, and around a $290 per cow being opportunity costs. And that is primarily unpaid labor and the return to labor back to the producer. But in these operations, we saw 
21 out of the 25 farms were covering their cash costs, or about 84%. 18 out of the 25 farms were covering both cash and depreciation costs. So that was 72% of the farms, and that's pretty good. And we had eight out of the 25, about one third of the farms covering total costs, both cash, depreciation, and their opportunity costs. And I really wanna stress this was based on 2020 data, that was our baseline year, but it really does show that we do have profitable operations out there that are not just surviving, but really thriving in the business. Now we did have a range of herd sizes from about 35 to 350 head. And this captures the majority of producers across Canada, but definitely not the majority of the cows. We have a lot of cows in larger herd sizes, and that is something that we're missing. And over the next two years of data collection, we do want to fill that gap of getting those larger herd sizes. But as you can see, economies of scale is a major driver of costs. Um, and on the right hand side, there's also opportunities for improvement within that, um, because size is not the only factor um, impacting the competitiveness of these operations. Now, standardized methodology was a real priority for the network as we're collaborating with every single province, and a number of provinces had existing methodology that they were using. And there's a good reason for the differences in the methodology that different provinces are using. Um, they have a different question that they're trying to answer um, when they're working with producers. And so when you do methodology choices, it's really a question of what do you wanna get out of the analysis? And when we're presenting this data, we really need to be transparent about what costs are or not included or excluded. So one of the main methodology questions that you're going to face when doing cost of production is allocation. Now, specific allocation requires producers to allocate their overhead costs, such as machinery and buildings, based on how it is used in each enterprise. And this gives the highest precision and also has the highest response burden for producers. But it is absolutely necessary if you want to calculate something like yardage. At the other end of the spectrum is gross margin analysis. This is where the overheads are set aside and each enterprise is evaluated only on their variable or direct costs. This has the lowest response burden for producers, and it also avoids issues such as what happens if you eliminate an enterprise and are left with 40% of a tractor that now needs to be picked up by someone else or another enterprise or commodity. Now, the model that we're using um, allows for both of these options, but for simplicity's sake, we chose to use generic allocation for machinery and buildings. And this is where overhead costs are allocated based on the percentage of revenue each enterprise brings to the farm. And this means that the proportion of overheads covered by a commodity will fluctuate from year to year. And this allows cost of production to reflect the diversification on farm if you've got multiple commodities being used as a risk management strategy. Now, I want to stress that there are situations where you would pick one or another of these, and that would be completely appropriate. But here you can see that in using generic allocation, it's going to impact each farm differently based on the overall farm structure and how many enterprises they have present. Another major difference is how feed costs are treated. Some cost of production programs use the market value for feed. An example of this is AgriProfits um, in Alberta, where they use the market value for their winter feed costs. They also use the market value for their pasture costs. So everything is treated as if it is rented um, and is therefore a cash cost instead of having the equity and um, not having that cash cost. In the cost of production network, we are treating um, feed at the cost of production if you're producing it, really showing the benefit of having that homegrown feed instead of at market value. So one of the things 
th there's pros and cons to each of these choices. Agri profits allows you to show the return to your feed enterprise, whereas in the cost of production network, when we use cost of production for feed, um, we don't have a feed enterprise. We're putting it in as that only exists because of the cow-calf enterprise. And it really then changes where things show up. And so we tend to have lower cash costs, but we then have other things that show up in our opportunity costs. So there's an opportunity cost for land if you were to actually rent out that pasture instead of using it yourself and it's fully paid off. And I should point out that the methodology choices were chosen by the provincial coordinators and can be custom customized for any analysis that we want to do. On average, we had between 150 and 250 winter feeding days, but you can see that each of the farms and how they're structured really varied in what that winter feeding period looked like uh, between the use of their field feeding, whether that was um, swath grazing of cereals or whether that was a grazing of standing corn or whether they were doing a partial supplement on pasture versus providing full feed. One of the things that we would like to get greater coverage is, of is the use of aftermath um, grazing on annual crops. And we know that winter feeding is a large portion of a cow-calf producer's total cost of production. And back in 2001, um, there was a study that found that using different winter feeding systems had a fluctuation in costs of about 70 cents per head per day between the highest cost and the lowest cost system. Since that study a decade ago, there have been significant changes in feed costs. And when we looked at the costs on in the cost production network, what we found is a very wide range of uh, between a dollar to almost $4 per day with an average of $2.30 per head per day for feed. And in this, winter feed costs include all of the costs for producing that, including their machinery and inputs for the homegrown feed, as well as market value for any purchased feed. So findings from a 1980s agricultural crisis study found that in terms of net income, Economists saw the difference between the top 25% of operations and the average operation can be as little as 5% on productivity, prices, and input costs. And this is generally referred to as the 5% rule. And this is the idea that when you have the accumulation of small increases um, between 2 and 5% in these areas, it's going to add up um, to more than a 15% improvement in profitability. And it's really a similar idea of compound interest paying dividends. It makes even larger cumulative impacts to your bottom line. And what we did in the network is we asked producers uh, what they were focusing on for incremental improvements in order to create future farm scenarios. And we discussed what these incremental improvements could be um, while also taking into account um, trade-offs and potential unintended consequences, recognizing that anything they chose would have to be something that they're willing to do um, within their production system. But we were doing this because we recognize there are massive spreads in income between the top 20% and the bottom 20% of producers. A US study in 2015 showed that that spread can be up to three quarters of a million dollars. And it's a difference between making half a million dollars per year or losing a quarter of a million dollars per year if you're in the bottom 20%. And this isn't based on available resources. It's based on optimizing resources that are already available to you. And so with that, I wanna share three scenarios that were chosen by multiple farms. The first was using rotational grazing to extend the, winter, the grazing season and shorten the number of winter feeding days. This was assumed to be accomplished through greater grazing management, requiring the upfront purchase of a portable electric fencing system to allow for smaller pasture sizes, more frequent moves, and obviously that would need additional labor that would result in uh, up to a 10% improvement in stocking rates on the grasslands. 
Now, depending on the farm, this resulted in a range of impact of how many actual winter feeding days were reduced, and we calculated that. We also assumed um, that weaning weights were unaffected. Um, we used that to be, make these a conservative estimate. With all of the savings coming from reduced winter feeding costs and no increase in revenue from any additional pounds sold. Now, obviously, the stocking rate improvement will vary by location and weather, and it may actually be delayed over time because it may take a while for it actually to show up. The literature shows that there's a wide range in responses, anywhere between 5% and 50%, depending on the grass type and rainfall, as well as previous management. So if you had previously been doing rotational grazing, the impact tends to be smaller than if you were switching from continuous grazing. The results shown here are going out for five years when the full effect is assumed to be realized. And we're comparing that against the 2020 baseline year. And so you can see that the impact on the whole farm net income varied depending on the herd size, but it was positive for all the farms that we modeled. The second scenario selected by multiple farms was adjusting the calving season. We did two options for each farm. The first was increasing weaning weights by shortening the calving season to three cycles. And the second scenario was increasing the weaning weight by adjusting to an ideal calving distribution of 70% in the first cycle, 20% in the second cycle, and 10% in the third cycle. And we assumed that that could be reached over a five-year period. Now, if the farm already had three cycle, a three-cycle calving season, we adjusted to the ideal calving distribution within five years for our scenario one, or within three years in scenario two. So scenario two is always the more aggressive option for all the farms, depending on where they started at. Now, calving seasons can be shortened by pulling your bulls five days earlier each year, um, and that slow change avoids a sharp drop in conception rates, or by front-loading the calving season by breeding heifers two to four weeks ahead of the cow herd. Now, depending on how the farm is set up, um, they may be using community pasture, um, and those types of options may not be feasible. These barriers were discussed with the producers in all of the farms that chose this scenario, and they all had the flexibility to adjust their labor to do these things. Other options to achieve these results that may include a cash investment include heat synchronization, artificial insemination, or adjusting the cow to bull ratio. And you're going to notice in these scenarios here that we did not include any cash investments um, as there's no change in cost structure, um, but that may be required. Again, the comparison is from 2025 at the end of the five years um, forecast back to the baseline of 2020. And all of these changes were done slowly over the five year period. And a trade-off to consider is that um, cattle prices per pound may decrease due to the price slide on heavier weaning weights. So depending on the herd size, um, the results varied by farm um, with the biggest impact um, from that increased revenue on heavier um, calves at sale time. We're getting close to the end of my time, but I just wanted to let you know that we have the flexibility within the network to do a lot of responsive scenarios. And in July, we went out to our producers and we did a survey of how they were being impacted by drought in Western Canada. And from their responses in terms of how they were responding to drought conditions, expected yields for homegrown feed, as well as prices they were facing, we created best medium and worst case scenarios for feed yield and prices for 17 of our benchmark farms. And we saw that um, we were projecting that in a best case scenario, um, it would be a 44% increase in feed costs this year. Our medium scenario was 67%. But this is just an example of the flexibility we have to respond to situations and provide resources back to producers. 
Another scenario that we have done is we modeled what it would take if producers had to cull this year um, anywhere between their regular 25%, 50%, or 75%, depending on what their feed availability was, costs they were facing, their desire to maintain genetics, and cash flow situation. And what we wanted to see was what was the best option available to them in terms of rebuilding their herd size. Because when you are forced to liquidate, knowing that economies of scale is one of the biggest drivers for operations is that you want to get back to your ideal herd size as quickly as possible because your overheads are going to be um, spread over more cows. And producers who have to liquidate um, have the concern of that they're selling into a lower price market and that they're gonna be forced to buy back into a high price market if they're choosing to purchase back their replacements. And in the 1980s, that drought, red heifer prices increased 36% between the drought year and the peak price year about two to three years later. Now, producers obviously have options whether to rebuild within the herd or to purchase replacements. And there's biosecurity questions, as well as suitability to environment and management when purchasing replacements. But the overall objective is for the operation to minimize the equity drain. And what we found was that ideally, the producer would actually maintain their herd size and purchase feed if it's available. But if they were forced to cull by 25 or 50%, ideally, they would actually be rebuilding within their own heifers retaining as many heifers as possible that are feasible as quickly as possible. But once you get up to a 75% culling rate, it's really ideal to then be purchasing back um, bred heifers. Otherwise, it takes too long um, to get back to your ideal herd size. So we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to give you two more slides. We have a number of resources available on our Canfax website. So you can go to canfax.ca and see individual farm summaries, as well as fact sheets and other resources. And we're looking for more producers to sign up and participate in the network. We have a number of production systems that we would like to address. And if you're interested, you can go to the website and sign up before November 30th um, and tell us a wee bit about your production system so that we can group you in the right focus group. So with that, I'd invite you to join our extended learning session um, in 20 minutes, where we're going to have three producers joining us who are going to be talking about how they use cost of production on their operation. So with that, I'll say thank you and talk to you later. So for those of you who are joining us, welcome. I'm Brenna Grant, manager of Canfax Research Services and national coordinator for the Canadian Cow-Calf Cost of Production Network. And I'm pleased to be joined with three producers um, who participated in the network and are from across Canada um, to get some of their perspectives on cost of production here today. So we're going to start with introductions. And so, um, Mike, would you like to kick us off telling us a wee bit about yourself and your operation? Sure. I'm uh, Mike Buis, uh, Buis Beef. We, uh, we ranch just outside of Chatham, Ontario, so the far southwestern part of uh, Ontario. The area we're in is majority cash crops, so we're one of the few, very few livestock people in the area. Um, we have about 350 mama cows. We take the calves right through to retail. We have on-farm retail and uh, we feed a lot of byproducts and co-products and uh, try to graze our cash crop aftermath and our cash crop fields. We put some cover crops in uh, to get us some winter feed because we can't afford to pasture our ground. We need to make, uh, make double use of it. So we use it as, as cash crop and then we use it as grazing in the winter time. Excellent. And you're from Ontario? Yes, sorry, Ontario. <laughs> okay, excellent. And then we have Tyler, um, who's from Manitoba. Yeah, so we run a uh, 600 head cow, mama cow herd, um, and typically background uh, most of the of the calves. Um, we are located in Bertle, Manitoba, which is only about 20 miles uh, from the Saskatchewan border. 
um, halfway between uh, number one highway and 16 highway. Um, so generally we're not the, you know, the driest uh, part of the prairies. Um, and, uh, and we uh, typically use as part of our production system, um, some corn um, for silage and grazing. That's a, that plays a big part in our operation, but we are exclusively really a, a beef cattle operation. We, anything that we grow uh, is for livestock feed. Excellent. And Ian Murray from Alberta. Uh, good afternoon, um, Ian Murray. Uh, we ranch at uh, Acme, Alberta. With my wife, Carmen, together we run Shoestring Land and Cattle Company Limited. Um, we run about 200 mother cows uh, in our operation and then uh, keep those cows back and run them generally as yearlings uh, on grass uh, as a feeder operation as well. Uh, as uh, doing some annual cropping um, and trying to integrate livestock into that cropland as much as we can using regenerative grazing principles and, and farming methods. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Well, I, I, I'm sure the audience can see that we have diversity in production systems just with the three of you um, and how uh, you guys are doing different things to make it work uh, within your operations, whether it's that crop livestock integration, being specialized or um, facing pressures uh, about land use um, from a growing urban center. And so, uh, Tyler, if you could kick us off on what actually convinced you um, to join the Cost of Production Network. Well, really just uh, the value that I see in, um, in capturing that information, um, just even broadly from an industry perspective. Um, I, I, you referenced it uh, already, uh, like in your previous uh, presentation, the without that information um, being ch captured um, kind of on a broad industry basis, we really don't have any idea as to, you know, the, whether or not we're making any improvements. Um, we don't know, we wouldn't know how to address um, disaster scenarios like what we found in the, in the West this year with, uh, with the drought. Um, a lot of the work um, that, that you guys did this year uh, with the cost of production data um, really informed, I think, a lot of policy and a lot of uh, initiatives uh, to, to address the situation. Um, and they, beyond that, um, from our own kind of producer, uh, from our own um, specific farm situation, um, the way I see it is if I if I don't have any idea as to how I compare with others in the industry, then I can't really figure out what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are and, and how I can improve. Absolutely. Ian, how about you? Because you actually were already part of some cost of production work in Alberta. So it's a wee bit different for you. Yeah, it is. Uh, we've been part of the Alberta Agri-Profits program uh, since 2009. So we've actually got some, some longer term historical data that we're starting to build on. And then uh, once the cost of production program was announced last year, sometime I think it was, um, I was really thrilled that it was just tied right into the Alberta program for those producers uh, and that we could just, you know, step right on with, with what we were already doing. So um, as I said, we've been doing that uh, for since 2009 um, and really starting to see some value in that now with some longer term historical data where we can look at the year, I, I guess I've called it, you know, we're doing kind of a financial postmortem uh, on the year that was. Uh, looking at all our enterprises uh, across the board from our cow calf and then our, our pasture enterprise, our hay enterprise, forage enterprise uh, and, and cropping enterprise to see where we're doing and, and what improvements we can make, but also then analyzing that year. Um, how long were we able to graze? How long were we able to swath graze through the winter? Or was it a, a survival year like 2018 was rolling into 2019? And as we're seeing now with with uh, doing what we can to salvage 2021 going into 2022. 
That's great. And we're going to come back and talk about, you know, some of your learnings with that, that great timeline of historical data and how you're able to use it. But Mike, what about you? What interested you in the network? Well, I guess I'm, and I had a number of different thoughts in my mind when we, when we started looking at this. I guess um, one of them is we were looking at transition. So as I get more gray hair, my daughter is going to be taking over the farming operation. So we needed to take a serious look at each part of the operation of our different enterprises and see whether it made sense to stay in the cattle business, especially in an area where land is so valuable and we have so many alternatives that we can use land for. Um, so that was uh, probably first and foremost, we wanted to make sure that we were profitable and that we could continue on. And I guess some of the other thing was is, is um, you, you almost, and I don't know how really to describe it, except you, you, uh, you really like cows. And are we in the cow business because we like cows or because we're making money? So we needed to justify to ourselves that uh, it wasn't a hobby, that it was actually uh, a profitable enterprise. So we needed to have a serious look at some of that. And I thought this was a great way of forcing me to have a serious look at the numbers because otherwise you just kind of say, okay, and, and carry on to next year. But uh, this gave us an opportunity to take a serious look and, uh, and forced us to pull some numbers out that were maybe difficult to find. So that's, that's why we were interested in it. Yeah, and sometimes it's just helpful to have someone give you a document of saying, these are all the numbers you need to go dig up um, and see if you have. And sometimes you can feel really good of there's numbers you can put in those boxes. And sometimes you realize, oh, maybe I need to actually be recording something. <laughs> um, so coming back to Ian, um, you've been part of AgriProfit since 2009. How do you use cost of production data on your operation? I guess we use it two different ways. And, and one of which is, as I already alluded to, um, to track that profitability over time, trying to relate that back to our different management practices. Um, we do try and swath graze throughout the winter as much as possible. We run an extensive operation, uh, graze as long as we can into the, into the fall or winter and then uh, swath graze through the better part of winter into spring. Um, so that's plan A. And then as I alluded to, we wind up with scenarios like this where we're, we're already feeding cows prepared feed in November and we'll be doing that every day till, till spring. So um, we, can, we can track those costs. Now, going back to 2009, um, I remember very clearly our cost of production for wean calf in 2009 was $555 as a low cost producer. Um, and Dale Khalil at the time said, you know, is, with the numbers like that, we're definitely in that low cost, cost of production paradigm within the province, that's really good. And while still maintaining, trying to be a low cost producer, um, our 2019 report, where we wound up actually having to get cows custom fed through the winter of 2019 because of the 2018 drought, we'd seen that number push up to $1,350 while still trying to maintain a handle on our costs. Now my 2020 report came out a few weeks ago and I haven't had enough time to fully dissect it and make sure there haven't been any errors or anything with me accounting in it. But in 2020, we were able to swath graze until April 27th. We started calving April 28th. And we started pairing out newborn calves on stockpiled grass on May 10th. So that was the year we were able to hit it out of the park. And we brought that cost of production down to about $850 per calf after being $1,350 the year before. So we know that the different management strategies are affecting our profitability, but we need to have that knowledge of what the year was to go along with those numbers to know what those management decisions cost us. The second way we use them is that the reports are broke down um, expense specific. So we try and keep an eye on, on those expenses um, with our own historical data and then along with the benchmarks that come out uh, across the board for the producers 
in the program for that year so that we can see are we are we increasing our spending on vet medicines relative to historical norms or are we spending far more on vet medicines than the provincial average or um, labor or you know repairs and machinery so it, it gives us if there's something that appears dramatically out of whack um, where our biggest bang for the buck might be in addressing that that expense or or is that expense actually the one that should be out of whack generally they say that feed cost is the most expensive uh, expense in a cow calf operation and for example in 2019-20 um, we were able to reverse that where our pasture cost became our biggest expense and we certainly don't want to bring that down to force the feed costs back up so you make a great comment about you know the fluctuation you can see from year to year and the importance of not making big sweeping decisions on one year's worth of data um, that you're always connecting that back to what was your management what was the year like uh, how was that impacting your costs um, and taking that into account when you're looking at that data that's great how about you tyler yeah, I can think of three three specific uh, examples that don't don't uh, cross over too much with Ian's um, examples. I guess first off, when when we first moved back to the farm, um, we started. My wife and I started developing our own uh, operation, um, but yet it was all kind of combined with uh, my parents, uh, and so we used uh, the cost of production data to kind of. Um, help account for the, you know, the, and reconciling um, those differences. Now, um, you know, roughly 15 years further on, um, we have an, a junior partner that we've kind of brought into the farm operation. And uh, so we're utilizing the same principles uh, to reconcile the uh, costs uh, appropriately. Um, so that's number one. Um, probably more than anything, uh, in terms of where the real value was seen is on, on analyzing enterprises. Um, and so I'll give you a couple of examples. We used to do um, a lot of hay sales, um, at, like international hay sales into the States. And, uh, and, and we discovered that, that really uh, we weren't getting the utilization of the specialized equipment uh, that we that we had and the labor the added labor that was related to that pro um, to that enterprise um, so it led to a, a decision to just pull out of that uh, enterprise and um, and focus more on uh, the cow calf enterprise um, similarly we've kind of made decisions kind of regular i'd say on, on a timeline of every two years we kind of decide whether or not um it pays to background the calves or um or not uh, and if we are backgrounding the calves then um are we also grassing them or are we selling them in the, in the spring so that cost of production information is is pretty critical in making those types of decisions um the other one thing that I'd mention is that we we do a little bit of kind of more niche marketing um, on our cattle, uh, our calf sales. Um, we were certified as uh, e, uh, EU certified, so the animals that um, that we sell um, can go through a uh, follow protocols that um, would allow them uh, the meat to be destined for the the uh, EU market um, and. But it's not a slam dunk that um, because there are some added costs associated with that, i.e. You're, you're not permitted to um, implant the animals. And so we try to use the, uh, the cost of production uh, information um, because we, we did have some past information that we could leverage to compare what cost of production, what feed differences um, were, well, what feed cost differences were from one um, system to the other uh, that helped us kind of figure out whether, you know, whether or not it was profitable for us to, to go down that route. That's a great comment about 
you've got this regular cycle of actually checking if your backgrounding is a feasible thing or grassing is a feasible thing that you want to do. Um, one of the concerns that I've heard about that and having that great flexibility on your farm is how do you manage the tax implications from one fiscal year to the next um, if you're going to be that responsive? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, we tend to take it, I mean, you you kind of referenced it earlier, I think, and saying you're, you're kind of, maybe this was off the, off the call, but kind of a middle of the road approach. And we don't tend to go, you know, 100% one way or, or the other, we, we tend to bias a little bit, so that, um, and then we can manage other things with, you know, other uh, feed input or in, uh, or uh, crop input ingredients purchasing year of uh, if we if we do um, in excess of our normal uh, marketings, uh, then we'd be more inclined to go and uh, and put put some fertilizer in the bin for next uh, for next spring. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Tyler. Mike. So I guess um, i just trying to think what I can add that'll be a little bit different. So um, on cost of production, we've always really honed in and focused on feed cost, on our daily feed cost per cow. And um, that's been always our, our go-to and that's where we put every, you know, every bit of energy too. But um, after taking a look at some of this other stuff, um, we kind of likened it to a, a bucket with holes in it. So let's figure out where the leaks are and see what other leaks we can plug um, to keep more profit in the in the bucket, as it were. So start you start to look at um, how does our operation compare with others of our size for death loss, for example? Are we losing more calves than we should? Or where are other opportunities that we might have that, um, like Ian said, that our numbers are way out of whack? Can we have a look at that? And is there something we can do to bring us more in line? Or are we doing a good job there and we can we can focus on something else? So I guess that's kind of where where it started taking me in, in that direction. Let's see what we can what we can fine tune and what we can what we can change. And that really is the 5% rule. It's all about doing these little tweaks that add up. And I didn't have time in the earlier session, but for anyone who has kids and watches Cars 3 where you have all, this is Lightning McQueen, the little cartoon. Um, but Lightning McQueen and all of his contemporaries are pushed off the racetrack by the new young models who are, you know, a quarter of a percent better on acceleration and, you know, a fraction of a piece better, you know, um, with thrust or speed or something. It's all technical car stuff. But it, it's all about those little things that you're constantly just looking at and tweaking um, for that 5% rule. So just you guys all know your numbers and have worked with your numbers over the years to varying degrees. Um, do you use cost of production data um, as sort of the first thing um, or are, is it more of a confirmation tool where you've got sort of a gut response of this is what you're going to do and then maybe I'll look at the numbers and make sure my gut's right. Um, sort of how does that work out for you as you're looking and working with the data? Um, and Tyler, do you want to start? Yeah, I could start. Um... I, I think if I'm true to myself, I probably do, uh, you know, develop a gut. I mean, we're, when we're out there working, you know, and, and feeding and stuff, I'm sure we're all thinking the same thing. How, how can we do this better? How can we do this cheaper? Um, and I think that starts with a gut, but the, the cost of production data, I think allows us to kind of, um, verify that the you know or, or at least come you know develop scenarios um that would kind of lead us into you know making making the leap um as long as you know and then and then capturing the data from that point to confirm um so i would say gut and then confirmed by uh by data excellent mike yeah i i'd agree 100 percent with that and i think I think we, uh, when we come up with a new idea or something we want to try, then it's, it might be helpful to have a look at some of that, 
but I think at the end of the day, it's our gut feeling. We think this is going to work. And in our mind, we've got it sorted out how it's going to work. So let's try it, see what happens. And, uh, and then we'll confirm at the end of the cycle, whether we, whether we made a good decision or a bad decision. And I guess if we, if we don't make some mistakes, we're not trying hard enough. So that's, <laughs> we got to make at least one new mistake every year. And it's got to be, the keyword is one. <laughs> and, uh, a new one. So we, we have to stop making the same mistakes every year and, and try new ones. And uh, that's the only way we're going to learn and come up with a better, a better solution. And like Tyler said, we got to figure out a cheaper and an easier way to do everything. And we got to continuously look at it. Yeah. So with that, Mike, because everyone has a different appetite for risk, do you start with your new things that you try on a fairly small scale or are you kind of an all in? I'm middle of the road. So, and I try to, I try the new things I try to do, I try to do them right up by the highway. So everybody driving by can see and, uh, and comment on, on what that crazy guy's doing now. So for example, we, uh, when we started in cow calf, we fenced off hundreds and hundreds of acres of prime cash crop ground and everybody where it was convinced we were completely crazy until they watched us grow our regular crop and then put cows out in the fall and winter to graze on the aftermath and then uh, then maybe it wasn't quite so crazy of an idea but uh yeah we're we're we experiment a lot just to try to find something that works and yeah we, we have failures but it's the only way we learn absolutely how about you ian uh probably middle of the road as well uh certainly not afraid to try some stuff maybe don't go uh too large of a scale uh, all the time, but uh, we, we do we do try and push that edge as well and uh, try some innovative stuff, try and learn as much from others. Um, there is still, I mean, we, we try and mitigate a bunch of risk as much as we can with feeder insurance and, and crop insurance and, you know, that kind of toolbox, um, but also trying to to push that edge and, and trying trying new cocktail mixes, uh, you know, trying to, to integrate the cows into that cropland as much as possible. Um, yeah, we are certainly certainly playing around with uh, with some different levels of risk uh, on different aspects. So bringing up risk there, um, what are some of the non-economic considerations when you're, you're looking at an innovation or something that you want to try um, th that is really sort of a, a determining or key factor for you on your operation? Go ahead, Ian. Is that to me or someone else? Yes, that's to you. Okay. <laughs> We're going to ask everybody. Um, I guess looking at both the short and long-term economic benefits of it, we've, we've really tried to start focusing in on our soil health more. Um, feel that anything we put towards that effort is going to pay off in a long-term benefit. Um, there might be some short-term losses or, or, or not to, not to necessarily say short term losses, but definitely maybe some some short term hurdles to overcome um, with an outlook that the long term benefit outweighs any short term pain that there might be in, in transitioning to some different systems like that. Um, yeah, that's probably probably the best one is, is trying to look at you know that that balance between the short term and, and the long term um, benefit to to the to the ranch as a as a system. Are we looking at just just a cash flow operation, or are we looking at building soil health, building biodiversity, resiliency? You know, can we ride out a year like this better by the decisions that we've made over the last three or four years, rather than just focusing on that six month growing season? And I think that's a great comment, Ian, because, and that's one of the reasons why when we did those future firm scenarios, we did them out five years. Um, and five years is probably too short. We, we probably truly need to take them out 10 years, particularly for some practices that th the benefits are definitely there and can be significant, but it takes a while for them to actually show up. 
And so it's those that future looking piece um, in terms of resilience of the operation, that, that's a great piece to recognize that you're investing in your own future. Um, Mike, what about you for non-economic considerations in your decision making? So I think we need to be long-term sustainable. So um, we need to have a, a serious look at like, kind of like what Ian was saying, what effect is what we're doing today going to be on soil health, on everything else down the road? And I think as we look at, you know, because we're, we're um, such a, our operation is such a diverse one, we have so many things going on that one change makes a difference to everything. And we start to look at, so for example, fertilizer costs. So all of a sudden, the manure that was a byproduct or something that we needed to get rid of, all of a sudden has quite a bit of value this coming year when fertilizer prices are going up so high. Um, so that helps our cropping enterprise. Um, we look at the climate change aspect and, and how well can we, because we've been growing cover crops and taking care of our soil for so many years, that helps us weather the droughts and the significant rainfall events quite a bit better than some of our neighbors that haven't been paying quite as much attention to their soil um, on the long term. And I think the having the cattle in the mix definitely helps us overall uh, maintain kind of a level profitability. So when we're when we're making more on the cash crops, then perhaps we're not doing quite as well on the cattle and vice versa when it's the other way around. So it kind of balances everything out and helps uh, keep the whole farm um, in a profitable as a profitable business. Absolutely, that long term view of commodity cycles. And you, Tyler. Yeah, I, I'd follow up with what Mike said about climate change. I think, uh, you know, while, um, I mean, it's pretty evident um, in in the larger society that that is a, you know, that's a growing issue that we all, I think, need to be uh, thinking about. Um, and I, I'm answering the question, um, non-economic, uh, you know, factors, Um and my hope is that this will become an economic factor that um, that I'm convinced that as uh, as beef producers um, are on the land uh, and, and in a in a grazing system, uh, we can be uh, a, a net um, carbon like carbon sequesterer. And so um, my my hope is that uh, we can move these non-economic related decisions that I think we, you know, that it, that aren't generally impacting our bottom lines uh, directly. I, I would agree with um, with the other two about uh, it, about its impact on resiliency and, and soil health, um, but we're not seeing, you know, direct uh, benefits from, um, from that added organic matter that we're adding to the soil. Um, and so my hope is that we can, we can really, um, I, I suspect that that will play a larger and larger role on our operation over over the coming years, and it's definitely a focus of ours. Um, second to that is just uh, is you know the work life balance. Um, uh, and if I'm occupied um, in, on the farm, uh, one of the questions might be, well, would I rather be in a tractor or would I rather be on a quad moving cattle uh, in a in a rotational system and for me, it's the latter, um, and so uh, so that's a factor that that is always, <laughs> you know, plays a big part in you know in some of the you know larger strategic decisions that we make because um, we all want to enjoy our days, right? Absolutely. And I'm actually really glad you brought up that work-life balance, Tyler, because that's one thing that actually came up in our focus groups fairly often is the fact that th there are some production practices that aren't going to be adopted because of that family dynamic and uh, allowing members of the family to do things they love and enjoy, um, even if they're not the most efficient thing out there. 
So we're going to take some questions from the chat. And so if anyone has a question, you can plug it into the comments there. And so I'm just going back up to the top. And one of the questions from the previous session was, were any of the surveyed farms integrated farms that do separate enterprise analysis for cow-calf versus their feeder operations? And the answer is yes. So we actually had most of our 25 cow-calf operations had retained ownership of some kind, whether it was preconditioning, backgrounding, um, and or as I don't know who it was, Ian or Tyler who mentioned backgrounding and then going to grass as yearlings. And so that's one where uh, the results that I presented were just for the cow-calf enterprise only, which stops at weaning. All of the individual farm summaries also has a section um, for the farms that had retained ownership um, and how many days it was as a separate enterprise. And so those you've got the enterprise analysis as well as the home farm analysis that was completed and provided. So moving down here, we've got some great comments in here. So this is from Jessica. Are there any platforms for livestock producers to help them track data on their operation, similar to field view for crop producers? And maybe I'll have each of you guys respond with what you use and what you're aware of that's out there um, for cow-calf producers. Um, Ian, do you want to start? I don't know if I'm the best one too start or not because in all honesty uh it still comes down to a fair bit of pen and paper um uh, daily journals recording what we're doing as far as grazing records i mean we do keep extensive records uh on grazing days paddocks feed allocations throughout the winter um but a lot of it comes down to still with our operation pen and paper records uh excel spreadsheets um, we're certainly not um, overly automated as far as any other uh, operational software um, that's out there. So, And with your pen and paper, because there's the majority of producers are still pen and paper, there's no judgment about that. What kind of a pen and paper system do you have that actually works so that it's not super overwhelming? Uh, as I said, we use a, I use the same day timer for the last 20 years. So writing, writing down daily what uh, what we're doing uh, as far as you know the, the, the feed rations throughout the, the winter. Uh, so that when we go to do our cost of production, I can I can just sit back and uh, and record those down. Um, grazing day charts um, with the, the days in days out um, at the back of that book. So it's all all contained. Um, Lots of the cattle stuff all comes down to uh, basically the same Excel spreadsheets that we've been using for years. So there's consistency within that, um, which is probably maybe the biggest takeaway in my system anyways, is, uh, is just the consistency of how I've been doing it for so long is that, you know, I could basically be asked any question and I could get you the answer instantly because I, I know where that information would be now whether or not someone could could step into my office and and take over that role it might be a nightmare but uh, but certainly as far as I my day-to-day -day management goes and and that compiling of the information for the for the agri profits program um, is just it's just pulling that information together absolutely thanks Mike so I guess we use we use a number of different things. And while it would be really nice to be automated, I find with the staff we have, it's much easier. Pen and paper works really well. Um, we do in the office, we have whiteboards. So we each farm has a different white, its own whiteboard, and we can add things to it, things that need to be fixed, things that are, you know, production or calve or calving uh, deaths, et cetera, et cetera, can all be written right on the whiteboard, which keeps it in front of everybody's face. Um, we have feeding charts that we actually, when you feed every day, you fill out the chart on how many pounds went to each bunk. And that keeps it really consistent between different people feeding, different uh, weekends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think probably 
the real downfall that I have, and probably a number of other people share that, is that a lot of the information's in my head. And I try to remember what I did last year and what happened when, and you can usually recall that pretty good. But uh, as we look into transitioning um, the farm to the next generation, we start thinking, so if I get hit by a bus, who, where are we going to pull this information from and where is it going to be? So I think that's one of our, our goals for the, for the winter time and upcoming uh, year is to, to make uh, some better permanent records that are easy for everyone to access. And I think that's probably where we need to, we need to focus on this winter. And it sounds like you've got some great systems in place already, and it's a constant development of some of those systems and processes. Absolutely. Tyler. Yeah, uh, three, I mean, pen and paper is probably uh, an important part of all of our operations, and it probably is just reflected by the fact we're all so individual, uh, so unique, uh, that there's no one uh, software uh piece that that can work but um off the top of my head we use three different things that kind of feed into our our, our costing and our our data capture um on from the grazing standpoint we use a an app called pasture map um which one of the benefits of it is it's got the history and the grazing um the, the grazing days on each individual paddock um and we so we apply that against some of the weaning weights and, and it helps inform um, decisions about the management of those paddocks a, into the future. Um, and so that's that's really helpful. We ended up starting it because it got to the point where if I wasn't here, then the records weren't being kept. And so and and, it, and we needed kind of reminders. And so it kind of did a lot of that. And the benefit was we could use the data after the fact um, really effectively. Um, second thing uh, was uh, we, we do use for some of our really, uh, um, for our, we don't have a cash crop operation, but we do have annuals that we grow for, for feed production. Uh, and so we use um, Ag Expert Field uh, to manage some of the operations in the fields and capture the, the costs on that. Um, and then uh, lastly, the from a herd management standpoint, we're, we're, we're really um, loving the, the Google Sheets. Um, so we, uh, during calving season, we developed a form that feeds into a Google Sheet. Uh, and then uh, the Google Sheet is where we hold all, all data related to the herd, uh, whether that be medications or uh, retagging or... Um, uh really everything with managing withdrawal periods um capturing uh daily gains on on calves um and so uh it's that's been a, a big uh, a big improvement for us just in the last two years well, thank you. And we have just like 30 seconds left here. So we're going to do a lightning round of what would you like to tell other producers about taking the time to calculate their cost of production? And Tyler, do you want to start? I think it just opens doors. Like it, it opens up more thoughts that you hadn't really considered previously. So that to me is the biggest thing is that you can, it makes you start thinking about things beyond um, because you can you can move to the next level when you can confirm that that's the right decision. Absolutely, Ian. It can certainly be overwhelming. You know, it, it's sitting down in early January to start digging through and, and amassing all that paperwork and pulling those numbers together. Um, but it's definitely it, it's got the value to it, especially when you do start to be able to put together some historical data uh, and and get that that information coming at you. So. It's well worth the effort is just convincing yourself that you need to do it. You bet. Mike? Uh, yeah, the old saying, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, I think this goes just one step fur further. Like we're good at collecting a lot of data and piles and piles of, of data, no matter how you collect it, you've got it somewhere. But if you don't figure out how to analyze that or how to compare it to something else or to dig into it to make some changes or make some progress 
or see where you are so that you are you are we going ahead or are we going backwards if you don't analyze the data um, responsibly or or um, in a good manner then uh, it's just wasted data and it's just numbers on the page so I think it's it's an important step to 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 staying profitable and staying sustainable in the in the cattle business. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and I want to thank Ian, Tyler, and Mike um, for sharing from your experiences and taking time out of your schedules because it's been a very busy fall for all of you um, with lots going on. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share today. And so with that, uh, I'm going to let you all go to the next session because there's still lots to take in here at the Egg Excellence Conference. So thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you.